Hey everybody, sorry about the mess. Uh, clearly I'm in the middle of filming a couple things, uh, but I wanted to stop real quick and show you a panel that I did for the Uplink convention uh, brought to you by Long Island Retro uh, a couple weeks ago. And so uh, this was a panel that was done by myself and Tony of Hardware Games. And it ended up being a really great discussion about the art of Nintendo Power. So I thought you would all enjoy that. And uh, so tuck in. It's a long one. Uh, but I hope you'll enjoy it. And, uh, and yeah, I will see you next time. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Welcome to what is it, the, the artistic magnificence of Art of, Nin of Nintendo Power. That uh, absolutely is not my title, for the record. Uh, <laughs> it should be. It's not a bad title. <laughs> it's, it's not. Um, but uh, anyway, I'm Stefan, um, known on the Twitters and a few other places as Art of Nintendo Power. Um, you can call me Stefan. It would be weird if you called me Art of Nintendo Power. But anyway, this is uh, my co-host, partner in crime here today, uh, Tony from Hard for Games. Hi, Tony. Hey, everybody. Very happy to be here, and thank you, Stefan, for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for agreeing to this, because there's no way that I could do this and try to pay attention to, to the chat at the same time. Um, <laughs> uh, before we get started, I just wanted to mention a couple things. Uh, I put this deck together. I finished I don't know if you guys saw in the, the, uh, the lobby chat, but I actually finished this deck like 45 minutes ago <laughs> so like some of these are like if i had them if i, I had like scan nice scans readily available uh some of these images are going to be very nice and easy to see and then some of them is like me running out into the living room and taking a photo of a picture frame um so so the quality on on images varies and i apologize for that um the other thing that i wanted to mention is i am a, a single dad of a five-year-old uh it's just me and her so at the, there's a 100% possibility that at some point she's going to come bursting into here needing something. So uh, I just wanted to to set that expectation at some point, take a minute or two to grab her food or water or something like that. So, um, but anyway, let's get started. Uh, again, my name is Stefan Reese. Um, I am a uh, collector, enthusiast, preservationist of video games and video game uh accoutrement. Um, I've also been uh, working in the industry uh, full-time for almost 20 years. I'm a producer in the mobile game industry currently. Um, but uh, so I guess I'll, I'll start with how this all got started. So for those of you who don't know, I uh, own and curate the uh, largest private um, collection of original art from Nintendo Power Magazine in the world, world. And um, and uh, that all kind of got it was born out of me starting to collect games. I started just collect uh, retail stuff, right? So I decided I wanted to, to. Originally, it started with, you know, wouldn't it be cool if I got every single Super Nintendo game ever? That was like a childhood dream. That was like you know that I could that I could reasonably fulfill. And uh, you know, as an adult, and so I started working on that, and then. Um, I found as I continued to go that almost as much as I liked the stuff, I liked the hunt, right? Um, and so I kind of, and Tony, maybe you have a similar experience with, you know, because cause you're so much into like prototypes and kind of a little bit off the beaten path stuff. With mm -hmm. the retail stuff, it tends to be expensive, but not difficult, right? Mm -hmm. And so... So as I was putting these sets together, it was like, okay, I'm spending all this money. I'm 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 acquiring all these sets. I I did 12 retail sets, North American retail sets of various consoles, and uh, I was like, that. So what's uh, what's harder, right? And so then I started like, okay, well, what's harder? Mm -hmm. We'll we'll start doing uh, displays, right? So I started collecting displays, and I did that for a while. Fiber optic signs and posters and and standees and all that stuff. Um, and then I sort of got to the point where I got everything I wanted there. And I was like, okay, well, what's harder? 
Um, and so then I started getting into gameplay counselor memorabilia and like Nintendo employee memorabilia. And I was like, okay, well, this is like where I want to be. This is, this is hard. Right. Um, and then uh, really it, the art piece of my collecting started when I found a Nintendo gameplay counselor who just so happened to have left counseling and started, started working for Workhouse USA, which was the essentially the, the art house that um, that did a lot of the, the art for, for Nintendo Power Magazine. So as we we're talking, he's like, well, sorry, I don't like I was looking for jackets at the time, the, the cool like uh, gameplay counselor jackets. And and uh, and I was like, well, he's, he says, I don't have any I don't have any like counselor stuff left over, but I do have some art that I drew from Nintendo Power Magazine. And my mind just sort of blew up. Because I was just like, it never occurred to me, either growing up or even as an adult, that like, it was almost like, you know, when you're a kid and you're watching a cartoon and you don't really register the fact that like somebody is voicing that character and like that's a real person. It, it almost ended up feeling like that where it never occurred to me that, that like people drew all that art in Nintendo Power Magazine. Um, and so... Uh, so I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm super interested in that. And then so it kind of spiraled from there where, uh, you know, he knew people who knew people who knew people. And suddenly I was I was um, it kind of enthralled into this community of artists from Nintendo Power Magazine inadvertently. And here we are um, two, two years later, um, and the, the collection is about 350 pieces strong <laughs> um, and uh, and growing every day. And, I'm, you know, I'm. I'm still still out there every day trying to uh, trying to grow this collection. Um, the real goal, and this is actually kind of a this convention is one of my like first steps into really the next the next leg of my journey here. The real goal is to share this collection with the world. And prior to the pandemic, I was I was set up to I was going to show at E3, I was going to show at CES, I was going to show like I was do I was set up to do all these conve all these shows um to sh to be able to share this art and then the pandemic happened and everything got now we don't have any shows um and so this is sort of a stopgap mm -hmm. shows like this are kind of a stopgap and my things like my twitter account uh and my youtube channel those are all stopgaps to the real goal of me getting out there to shows and showing you all of this art in person because it's just again i think for a lot of people they they don't just it doesn't really you remember the magazine, but that, but like as a kid, I just don't know that people, a lot of people really understood like how much artistic talent and how much work went into, um, into the magazine. So, uh, today's presentation is going to be kind of like that. And, um, and so we're basically, I've, I've sort of broken down, uh, the magazine, the early magazine into categories of different types of art. And so I thought it would be fun to go through and share the various different types of art with you guys and be able to show you process and be able to kind of explain how things were made, how the sausage was made, as it were, um, and, uh, and kind of give you a, a more in-depth um, view of Nintendo Power Magazine. So I'm going to share my screen. Let's see. Thanks. Your screen. This one. All right, so I apologize. Um, the way that this is set up, I don't really have a preview of the next slide, so I'm kind of going to go through these a little bit blind, but we should be okay. Um, so we're going to start out with the covers, and really there's three main types of covers uh, that I kind of segregate things into, and that's photo covers, like Covers that are like actually someone took a photo of something and turned it into a cover. Then there's the painted covers, and then there's hybrid covers, which are either like mixed media or like a photo and a painting, that kind of thing. So I want to go through these types of covers and kind of show you examples of each of them. So we're starting with photo covers, and this is actually one of the first pieces that I uh, acquired. This was these these shoes um, walked up to me, no pun intended, <laughs> at um, at Portland Retro Gaming Expo 19. Uh, when I was staffing, I, I again I had mentioned I collect gameplay counselor memorabilia, and I was staffing a gameplay counselor exhibit in the museum. If any one of you uh, happen to 
have seen that that show. Um, and a vendor came up to me and he goes, hey, I have uh, I have some Howard and Nestor art. And I was like, great, that's cool. I'm into that. And then he goes, uh, but I also have these shoes. And uh, this was like the, the first foray into the the like when I see a piece and I go. There's no way that these should still exist. Like what <laughs> what had to happen that these these stickered converse actually survived 30 years and are now like sitting in front of me. Um, so again, the, a lot of the, the photographed covers were very uh, put together, uh, very kind of seat of the pants like this. Like this is just a retail pair of Converse with, with literal stickers and things glued to them. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so things were very kind of seat of the pants for these, these original photo covers. Same thing like the, the the Zelda 2 cover um, is just a series of mannequins. It's just a link, a mannequin link, and a mannequin Zelda uh, dressed up, and and they with some like Halloween store uh, props, and uh, and they shot that cover. This is just a pair of decorated shoes, and they just shot that cover. Um, here's another example of a photo cover. Here, um, this is again um a prop that i was surprised existed because of the size usually the things that that have survived from uh the physical covers are very smaller pieces and we'll get to those in a minute but um but wiley here is actually the size of a little bit bigger than a regulation football um and so um usually with because you have to remember in the 80s the artist, the contract artists weren't thinking like, oh, someone's really going to care about this uh, you know, historical value. It's the same way with with prototypes, Tony, right? Like the, at the time, mm -hmm. nobody thought like, oh, hey, I should save this build, right? That someone will yeah. want this someday. Um, For them, it's just and, work, you know. Right, it's just work, right? And so it's the same work. thing. Like one of the pieces that didn't survive, that is that is uh, uh, that um, is among these physical covers, is the Maniac Mansion mansion. If you remember the Maniac Mansion cover, it's this, it's just basically it's a two to three hundred pound piece of polymer clay. It's just gigantic, and so that was uh, as as wonderful as it that pieces like this survived. That piece almost immediately was destroyed. They were just like, okay, well, here's this huge piece of polymer clay. I, I don't want this taking up space in my studio, and it was thrown in the garbage. Um, so, hmm. so that 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 is really why I'm surprised. I'm always surprised when larger pieces uh, end up surviving because it was, you know, it, it's a space commodity, right, uh, at the time for them. Oop. There's a close up of, of Wiley and Mega Man. So these guys are made out of uh, polymer clay and sort of found objects. A lot of them are kit bashes. Um, it's difficult to see in this picture, but like the, um, do I have a, like a, do I have any sort of marking tool? I don't think I do. Um, the, but like the, the, those silver pieces on the top of the dome there uh, on, Wiley, in, on Wiley's ship, those are like plumbing, little plumbing gaskets. Um, if you look at the underside of a ship, let's see if I can go back. No, no, that's not what I wanted. Oh God, <laughs> it's all good. Um, there, that's better. Was that? Sorry. Um, if you can kind of see the underside of a ship, that's all just like um kit bashes of um like Gundam Gundam parts and random little uh model kits, little plastic model kits, and they're just kind of glued up into the bottom of this thing. Um, so it was very, it was very found object for a lot of these pieces. Um, and then another thing that I think is interesting about these, so this is clearly the, the model for Mario, for uh, the Mario paint cover. The artist knew exactly the angle that this guy was going to be photographed. And so, like, again, it's just work for them. They don't want to take any more time than they have to on these pieces. So he just didn't complete the front of Mario. Uh, it's just this like crazy Cthulhu looking hose beast. <laughs> um, and, uh, and you know, it's a popsicle stick and, and, and blank polymer clay. Um, but it was just out of necessity. They, they just didn't need to build uh, the, the, the back half of Mario. So they didn't. Um, so that's uh, now we're going to kind of transition into 
paint, painted covers, more traditionally painted covers. Um, 90% of paint, of the, the painted covers were done in airbrush and they were done um, in acrylic. And they were actually created by almost exclusively two people. Uh, one of the artists' name is Dan McGowan. He did not paint this, but we'll get to some of his, his pieces. Uh, Dan, unfortunately, uh, died in 2008 of cancer. Um, and I was fortunate enough to um, sync up with his estate and kind of rescue some of these pieces from, from the attic, as it were. Um, and uh, but uh, but the process between both of these artists, the other artist I, I don't name because he's asked me not to. Uh, you have to one thing that I'll, uh, I should mention is that, you know, a lot of these, as we've said a couple times now, uh, this was work for for these these people. And, you know, they, they were not credited often. They don't want to be credited now. They don't you know, they're almost annoyed that I found them, let alone like wanting to open that up to like a larger community. Um, so, so it's, you know, whenever I, whenever I purchase a piece of art, my first question is, do you want to be named? And if you are named, this is what you can expect. This is the kind of the attention that you can expect. And then I just kind of leave it up to them. Um, because at first they're, you know, a lot of times they're like, well, why wouldn't I want to be named? And, uh, you know, and well, it's a matter of attention. Do you want to be known as someone who created something that's very beloved to a subset of people? Um, and sometimes the answer is yes, and that's great. And sometimes the answer is no. So, uh, so this piece is painted by an artist that I can't name, but I wanted to show this piece because it actually shows shows process. Um, so what you're seeing on the left there, this is obviously this is the cover for Street Fighter, the Street Fighter II Turbo um, Strategy Guide, and the piece on the left is done in pencil on like an onion paper or like a like a, a it's a thick tissue, a vellum. So what he did now, a lot of air, he basically added a step into his process. So what a lot of airbrushers will do is draw on whatever it is directly on whatever they were going to paint. And then they take um, it's a, like essentially a, a type of contact paper and they they place it over the piece and then use an, an exacto knife. They cut out all the shapes, being careful not to press too hard. To, so like it's really a crazy intricate thing because they're they're using an exacto knife to to cut through a layer of plastic, but not cut the piece of of art underneath. And so they'll essentially create a jigsaw puzzle, and then pull off a piece and airbrush it, and put that back down once it's dried, and pull off another piece and airbrush it. You know, the, a piece like this you're looking at, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of like 120 hours of work. Um, and um, so, but what this artist did was he added a step so that he could keep these pieces. So he drew the piece on on vellum, placed the plastic over it, cut it out, removed all of those plastic pieces, and put them on a different piece of artboard, and then went through the process. So, so what you're seeing is an exact replica. Uh, that's why these, you know, usually when you see roughs in art, there's, they're a little bit different, right? They, you know, it's, it's like, okay, well, this is my first shot at this piece, and now this is the final. You'll notice that with airbrush, in this artist in particular, the roughs, so to speak, are almost identical line for line because he, he used this piece on the left to, to trace the lines with an X-Acto knife and, and create the piece on the right. Um, it's just like, again, like I even, I've, I've talked to him a little bit because like once the, once we can travel and stuff, what I'd like to do is fly out and basically film him doing a, a cover. And then, and, and he's like, well, you, you understand that's going to be like hundreds of hours. And, and honestly, I didn't, but that's the kind of thing that like I, I'd love to, to be able to, to, to share with everyone is I actually like watch the process of this happening because it's just a complete because it's so complicated it's just the the uh it's just a lost art less and less people are doing it especially with you know things being more and more digital um there's just no reason or very little reason to go through this process anymore um is, is he the most patient man alive yeah he or... did like, I, I, <laughs> he did like i said there's there's probably like somewhere in the neighborhood of of 40 traditional covers and he did like half of them so you you know that's that's like 
thousands and thousands of hours. Just and that's just for his work on Nintendo Power. He also did, you know, like mm -hmm. um, album covers and like and and um, most of these commercial artists, they weren't they weren't like exclusive to the magazine. There were some that were our artists. A lot of the interior artists, and we'll see that later, were exclusive to the magazine. But a lot the cover artists weren't. They were just work for hire. So like he was mm -hmm. often like he he'd do this piece and then move on to a celestial seasonings ad or like whatever. Um. Like you know. It sounds like this individual is one of Nintendo Power's like primary like 1099 contract employees or kind con of contract workers basically were like consistently freelancing for this type of type of work. So there was a if you look at the credits, one of the things that makes tracking covers down so incredibly difficult is that while um, some employees did get credited by name in mm -hmm. uh, Nintendo Power, all of the cover ad artists except for Dan McGowan, he's actually the first, the only one that didn't um, got credited as Griffiths advertising. So it was Griffiths okay. that that contracted these guys. And then so like there was no name ever published except for Dan McGowan, um, mm -hmm. who was just he was just really, really early. They 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 changed over to just crediting a lot. It's a, um, same thing eventually happened to Workhouse where you uh, at, at the beginning you'd get like a, a block of like, oh, here's all the Workhouse employees. And then eventually they were just credited as a Workhouse USA. Mm -hmm. um, so it's the same thing happened in movies. Like we, there, there was a big, remember a few years ago, they were like, hey, you know, none of the digital artists are getting credited and that's dumb. And then so now we have these gigantic blocks of of digital artists credited in mm -hmm. movies, which is great. But yeah. Um, but yeah, a lot of people just didn't get credited. So I, I have a question for you. And then if you don't mind, there's a couple of questions in the Q&A section sure. I'd like to toss your way. Um, but the, the question that I had was, you know, you hear, what was it? Um, was it Activision that like a lot of the employees worked for Atari, they weren't credited and then they created their own company where they could have, you know, credit. Was it like a similar situation where like the, a lot of these artists like wanted to be credited, but they just weren't because like the, the contracting company was just thinking like, okay, no, we're just putting our name and that's it. Or is it just sort of like, was it totally kind of like an afterthought? They didn't care at the time. Yeah. You know, and, and a lot of the artists actually liked that anonymity. Right. Like okay. I was kind of saying before, like they just they didn't want to be credited, especially like on the Japanese side, because originally Tokuma, who was the, the, uh, a manga publisher, was uh, was the the company that that did a lot of the heavy lifting for Nintendo Power magazine. You know, uh, Minoru Arakawa um, looked at what they were doing in Japan in all, all their like monthly publications for for games. And they're like, well, we can do that. Like, I want, I want to do that. And so, to do that quickly, they just hired the people doing it in Japan. So, mm -hmm. um, and we'll get into. Well, I have a little bit of Japanese art, but like a lot of those guys, if you look at the credits list, they're credited under pseudonyms. Like they, mm -hmm. they, they specifically did not want the attention, right? Um, one of the the most prolific artists in uh that that did uh, or longest running artists that that was on the japanese side was always just credited as orange takamura uh or orange orange nakamura i'm sorry and um and and that's uh and that's the only like no one knows who that guy is because he just didn't he never was credited and like a lot of these guys were just were um just seasoned manga artists and that was just sort of culture for them that uh that they just weren't credited mm -hmm. So I'm going to, I'm going to ask you uh, one or two more questions just because they're, they're adding up a little bit. And I want to make sure that while people sure. are here, um, their, their, their questions are getting answered. So one that, one that's topical to what you're talking about, maybe you're going to cover this, no pun intended, uh, in a minute, yeah. but, <laughs> but Jeremy, um, I, I, I'm pronouncing his last name properly, Rydell asks, uh, which is your favorite cover art, uh, your favorite insert poster art as well? Wanted to see if you had any particular favorites. Um, yeah, so, um, so sometimes it's frustrating because I have to settle, like if a piece is already owned, I have to I have to kind of just settle for like knowing where it is, making sure it's safe, that kind of thing. Asking if I can scan it, that kind of thing. I do. If you watch, check my Twitter, I do that all the time, where I'll borrow things from people and scan them just so that they're safe, right? And my favorite cover is the Empire Strikes Back Yoda cover, and it drives me crazy because I know where it is, and uh, and I'm I'm working on on getting like at this point I may have to like take my scan, like the 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 person really doesn't want it to leave his possession. 
So at this point, I'm thinking about like packing up my scanner and like taking it to him and scanning it. Um, but uh, yeah, that's my my favorite one. My second favorite one, though, I do actually own, and it is a Dan McGowan cover. It's the Secret of Mana cover um, mm. that has the yeah the Flammy that doesn't look anything like Flammy on the cover. It's just this like random winged dragon. <laughs> So bad, but it's so I, good. <laughs> but it was the same thing. It was very similar to the way that um that it you know the way it was with uh, game covers is that a lot of times these artists had very little or nothing to go mm-hmm. off of, yep. and so um that's why like like on the poster that um that uh, um Takeda did um that dra- that flammy is like this red dragon up in a tree and like there's like every time you see that dragon it looks completely mm-hmm. different because they were just like i don't know it's a dragon you know <laughs> and uh, so that's like a lot of times you get things that are are not um are not uh necessarily canon uh this piece i wanted to show uh because t- talking about the the vellum paper um w- one thing that that makes it uh advantageous that this artist thought to do this and keep all these is that Nintendo wasn't always contractually they were supposed to give back art right As with the with the the contracted artists Nintendo was buying the image rights right they weren't buying the physical art which is why years later I'm able to track it down because it's not sitting in a Nintendo vault somewhere because they didn't buy the physical piece so they weren't always great about getting that art back and unless you were really on the ball like or you had a really good agent or you were just like a really a good self-advocate sometimes your art just got eaten and that was it like you just never saw it again so this Star Fox cover is one of those pieces the artist has no idea where the final piece is it's pro- it could be anywhere at this point but he did save these pencils so despite the fact that the the final piece is gone forever or maybe presumably right never i never say never because like you know 30 years is a long time for memory and so sometimes i have had people say oh yeah this piece was destroyed and then i find it somewhere else um but uh but uh but yeah so in cases like this like i'm i'm happy i was able to get these Star Fox pencils because you know at this point it's kind of better than nothing and i do again I, it's important to me to be able to show process um in this case here's a here's a pencil version of this cover that was rejected so um so because there were pencils um then we were able to see a piece of art that we would otherwise never be able to see so this is as you can see on the left there this is the wario land cover uh, a version of it that was then rejected for whatever reason and they gave it to a completely different artist so the cover on the right is clearly what we got and the cover on the left is just a cover that we would have never been able to see unless these pencils existed um uh, so going back to, uh, I went, so this is a piece by Dan McGowan, and I just wanted to kind of show a lot of questions. There's always a lot of questions around how big these pieces are, and so the next few slides are going to kind of show that that is not a consistent thing at all whatsoever, because here, which is very brave, because the smaller that you paint, the harder it is to do detail, and so and the easier it is to screw up. So in this particular piece, Dan McGowan basically painted this thing one to one, right? It's it's very it's maybe maybe three to five percent difference in size, right? Um, but he he painted this thing one to one, and uh, and it's like it's just an incredibly brave thing when you see uh, artists, especially airbrush artists, because the, you know there's there's definitely a control issue with airbrush, right? Um, and uh, so it just when you see someone painting this incredibly small, it just shows you how talented these artists really are. Uh, here again, this is uh, this is a, the Final Fantasy II cover, all painted almost one to one. And uh, and here's kind of the opposite end, which is funny because this is also Dan McGowan. This is again that Secret of Mana cover that I love so much. Um, I cried when I found this piece, but you can see how much larger it is. And this is more typical because, again, like it gives you a little bit more margin for error if you're painting very large, and then they shrink it down. Uh, I try to find the worst picture of me with this shot, with this <laughs> frame. Um, this is just a still from one of my YouTube videos on the piece, but this is physically the largest uh, cover that was made for Nintendo Power that I've found anyway. 
Um, and, uh, and what's more is that this is actually an oil painting, uh, which is the only, to my eye, the only cover that was painted in oil. Um, and uh, what's funny about this piece too is that the artist hates it. Because, <laughs> so uh, again, it's just, it, it, you know, a lot of times it's just work, but um, you can kind of see how uh, Belmont's appendages are sort of like uh, purposely um, out of the way of this like lower left corner. So originally that wasn't the case. This right leg of his was actually down here and the arm was further back. And so last minute, to accommodate for a piece of text that was going to be here. Um, they made him repaint it, but he had to just kind of do whatever like worked. So you can see like the, the this left foot here is like oddly shaped and like this is his arm is not exactly the same. His left arm is not exactly the same size of his right arm. And so um, this was a case where, you know, people also ask often how much I pay for something. Um, and sometimes I pay a ton and sometimes in this case, uh, I paid very little because the artist was like, please just get it out of my sight. Um, so, uh, um, so yeah, this was, uh, the, I kind of wanted to show this for size cause I, I mean, it's, you can, I'm, I'm six feet, I'm six feet tall. This, this painting is enormous. Um, so we're going to kind of start transitioning into uh, hybrid covers a little bit. This is still a little bit more traditional. The um, the background is painted uh, in in acrylics with airbrush, but Darkwing is actually a cell. So the line work on here is actually is actually printed on on acetate as it would a a cell, and then his color is actually behind him. And if I click to the next one, you can see this is at a very hard angle that I'm trying to take this picture, and you can see. Uh, the lines separating between the background and and his line work. Um, the line work, actually, I'm not sure. I have the pencils for that line work. I don't know where stuff like that. You know, a lot of times, like uh, it'll just it was throwaway, right? He was he he drew it so that he could make this piece of acetate, and so sometimes it's just like uh, and sometimes things, parts like that just get lost to time, unfortunately. Um, so this is probably the first example of what I would really consider a hybrid cover in that it's like a dude in a in a Halloween store ninja costume <laughs> photographed and then placed uh, behind a beautiful painting. So this one also is a Dan McGowan painting. But um, actually this one, once we start doing shows again, I really want to, I have a really high res scan of this piece and I want to make it a photo opportunity. opportunity. Like I want to like blow it up to a backdrop and then, because like I, I'm, I'm happy that I have a scanner that basically like I can scan things so that they could be on the sides of buildings, like uh, incredibly high resolutions. So, um, so I'd, I'd love to at some point be able to have a photo op, and so like people could come and like pose in front of this, in front of this piece for their own Ninja Gaiden cover. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, so this is also considered a hybrid piece, but this is a little bit different. This is. This is a photography still. If you look at the the the, the cell on the right there, the the net, the positive on the right, that was provided. It says right there from Warner Brothers. So Warner Brothers just this is just a photography cell or a, a piece of principal photography they took for Batman Returns, and they just gave it to Nintendo Power. So the the background here uh, is all hand painted airbrush. Unfortunately, I I haven't located it, but uh, but then the the photo. Uh, in front of him was just it, they just took a, a still shot from from Warner Brothers and imported it. Stefan, I have a question for you. Um, yeah. Just because you were mentioning possibly doing like a photo op of the Ninja Gaiden cover, there was there was a question here from Jeremy again that said, you know, what is your long term goal for the original art? I always encourage art collectors to consider museums with permanent collections and uh, repository status. So, I want to see is, is this um, what is your your ultimate goal aside from touring it around, or is it just touring it around as long as you possibly can um, and kind of creating a, a little mini museum in your home, or what is What's the the end game, so to speak, if you have one? So, yeah, so I can speak to this a little bit now, um, but under the pretense that there's also some uh, things going on behind the scenes that um, some like business cases that that are being investigated right now. Um, but currently, as it stands right now, if I were to drop dead, uh, the entire the entire collection is willed to the Strong Museum of Play. Um, I am not crazy about that 
honestly, because when you have a museum, a brick and mortar museum, they don't have the resources or the space or anything like the strong is very well funded. It's an amazing museum, but there's going to be very few opportunities where you will be able to go there and see a collection like this in its like full magnitude, right? Where more than likely 99% of it will sit in a storage facility or, you know, an onsite storage facility, which they'll be very safe, but they won't be shown. And so, you know, they'll, they'll kind of, bring things out of the vault as needed and put things out of the vault, you know, back into the vault as needed. Um, so I'm working on a different business solution that would allow the collection to basically continue to tour indefinitely. Um, but, um, but right now, everything would go to the Strong Museum of Play. Yeah. So it sounds like there's a plan and, fact, there's and then there's some... a future plan yes um yeah there's a there's a stopgap plan in, in case something terrible happens now and then yep. i'm i'm working toward a, a better solution for me um in 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 the long run well, that's a really good uh, so answer yeah. to that question <laughs> <laughs> Uh, going back to the hybrid cover. So this is actually probably the most hybrid cover I've ever seen. I wish I had any piece of this. But a lot of people look at the Star Tropics cover and don't realize that this is, you're looking at papercraft. So the bird is 100% papercraft. He's made out of, he's made out of like wrapping paper. Um, and then a lot of the little, the dudes uh, on the, on the bottom there are also form of papercraft. While the keyboard is clay. So they actually like part of this is built out as um, as like a physical model, and then with like papercraft uh, maquettes just kind of laid over it, and it's like the most ingenious thing I've ever seen in my life. Um, but uh, and again, I wish I had any part of this, but I just wanted to kind of show this because it's it is unique. Like there's no other papercraft cover, um, and uh, and it's just a great cover. Um, here's another. Some of these hybrid covers are really, really sneaky. So uh, don't have the original art for this. This is a Dan McGowan piece. We're still hunting for the original art. It might be somewhere in the estate. We're still looking. But this is the photography positive on the right of the original piece. So like essentially, I can preserve from there. Like we can we can scan off of these positives. So like you, from a, from a preservation standpoint, it's still safe. Um, despite not having the original, but if you notice, it's just the four turtles. And you look over here, and it took me it took me until I saw this piece to understand that the background that they're on is a physical model. That's a that wall is actually built is actually modeled out. Um, and uh, and it, it just it just never occurred to me. It's the same thing. I don't have a slide of it, but the um, the uh, rescue rangers piece. It's it's uh, a it, the um, the cover for Rescue Rangers is Chip and Dale are animated cells, but then the entire background is is actually sculpted, and um, and a lot of people just never realize that. Uh, way, Seth, so um, yeah, real, real quick, uh, Jeremy, who asked the question regarding what you're going to be doing with your your collection, said that your answer was excellent, and thank you oh, for thank carefully. You. Uh, thinking through the future of this collection, I wish all collectors thought this way. Yeah, I'm not. Um, I'm not a basement collector, um, and a lot of like. And when I say basement collector, I mean people who just sort of want the art or want the object for themselves and to lock it away in a basement. Um, that's never been that goal. Um, and I am. I'm blessed to be in a financial situation where like I don't have to like look at the collection as like this nest egg bailout thing that I need to sell off when I. You know, um, this isn't something that like Piper or my daughter will need, right? So it's not like, because that's one thing that like I get uh, a lot of is, you know, well, what happens, you know, what if your daughter wants this this collection? Like, and if she really wanted to be, to continue to participate in the collection, that's one thing, but just like willing it to her for, for as, a, as a piggy bank, like I don't want that because I see these stores, when I collect these art pieces all the time I hear stories of especially with unfortunately with the artists that are no longer with us like a lot of times their kids just did not care 
And so like, the, so I get stories of like, oh yeah, we had stuff, but we threw it out. Or like, oh, we sold it off at yard sales or like whatever. We let the agency keep it. Like all of these stories of the immediate family not really caring after these people are gone, right? So like it was really important to me to uh, make sure that this collection is for one thing to like secure my own legacy, but then also in 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 being able to say, okay, yes, this is all going to like a, 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 a there's a permanent solution for all of this work that helps me acquire more work, right? Because a lot of these artists are also concerned with their own legacy, right? And so to be able to say like, hey, like I'm gonna continue to share your work with the world forever or as long as I can, and then when I can't, it's going to be safe. Like that's a that's a big that's a big thing for for a lot of artists, right? Um, so he, we're gonna kind of wrap up covers here. And again, like this is not, you know, I have 350 pieces, I can't show them all today. Um, so I would absolutely encourage you as we come out of the pandemic and I start showing things physically again, um, that you attend shows or um, or tell your local shows about me and have them reach out and I'm happy. Like I don't, I, part of the whole system is is I, I, I specifically do not take money uh, or make money off of this collection just to kind of like make sure that Nintendo and I are cool. Um, and so um, so it's it's basically for a show to have me there, it's covering getting me there. And that's 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 all all the investment is for them. So um, so yeah, uh, I mean I, I'll continue to be on Twitter and stuff like that. But uh, if you want to see the whole collection, um, then uh, definitely uh, look for me at, at local shows in the future. But uh, so we're wrapping up the the cover section of the presentation. But I wanted to show a couple of opportunities uh, where we got completely like covers that we just never saw the light of day on. And uh, so this one is the uh, the Mortal Kombat three. It's clearly Cyrax, but he's super super off model. Right. And again, I think this they were just like, I don't know, he's a yellow robot. Go, you know. Um, and so, so they got so they got uh, got this piece that and incidentally, this is the same artist that did uh, the Castlevania painting. So clearly, like a, 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 a talented artist, like it was just he was not given very much information on Cyrax. Um, and so so we ended up getting this like super rushed uh, clip art version on the right. Um, because he was so incredibly off model, um, but uh, so yeah, that's a, that's a piece that that uh, that we never saw. This is another one that breaks my heart. So this is for for my Final Fantasy three fans. And again, I'm sorry about some of these photos. This was I literally just like took this picture in my living room this afternoon. So yeah, there's a lot of glare and stuff. But um, this is Shadow and Interceptor from Final Fantasy three, and uh, and I would have loved. First of all. American art for Final Fantasy at all uh, is incredibly rare. Like there's a handful of pieces and there's two of them in my living room. Um, so, uh, but, uh, but for whatever reason, and I can't imagine like, there's nothing wrong with this cover. I'm not, it had to have been a business case. It, you know, if you ask me that they, that they didn't go with Final Fantasy three, because it is the, it is the, um, the premier game in this issue. And then so to, to like, Clearly, like this was a or like a, a it's, it's it's a digital painting, the the Illusion of Gaia cover. So my guess is that it was a last minute thing, and they just needed to switch it out for whatever reason. Um, and for people, there is a much better scan if you look for uh if on Twitter on my Twitter, there's a much better scan of Shadow and Interceptor here. So, um, but uh, but yeah, this was just a cover that just didn't get it didn't get made, uh, and we got Illusion of Gaia instead. All right. Uh, anybody have any more cover questions before we move on to interior art? There are no more cover questions unless you guys want to uh, jump in and add some. There, there are three questions queued that weren't really related to covers that we can answer if you'd like, or we can answer them at the end. Sure. I mean, this is a good break. Okay. Um, so we have... Chris Small asks, what piece of Nintendo Power art exceeded your expectations when you saw the original art? Uh, that Castlevania piece is a good example. I had no idea. Like it, I, first of all, I thought it was a digital painting originally. Um, and so then to find it at all was like, holy crap. And then the sheer size of it, it was like completely stunning. And that it's an oil <laughs> painting, like, and that, which is unique among the, the, the Nintendo Power covers. It's the only oil painting. Mm -hmm. So um, that was 
that was a a, a very big surprise. Um, and then um, you know a lot of the a lot of the airbrush covers when you see them in person and you realize how much and, and when we get to the the Howard and Nestor stuff you'll see what I mean how much fidelity you actually lose between um, and intricacies that you lose between the 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 finished painting and and the actual production piece of art um, mm -hmm. and uh, so you know all the time I'm I'm super like all, how detailed that background is on that secret of mana dragon Let's see if I have to do it um, the foliage in the background of this piece is all like it's all every every little pip you see is hand placed I mean it's just like thousands of just like do, 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 do. it's um, wild it's really wild the yeah. detail there yeah so that th those kinds of things are really they're surprising to you because you just you, again like especially if you were looking at this magazine you know when you know of age right when we were kids you just you don't spend that much time looking at it. like you don't study it like that um mm -hmm. you know I, I certainly have visceral memories of like the dark wing cover for instance arriving in my mailbox but it's not like I'm not like I wasn't obsessively poring over it, like looking at the brickwork and you know that kind of thing. Um, and certainly, maybe some kids were, but um, but now as an adult and seeing it in its like full majesty, um, it's you really really notice the the, the fine detail. Mm -hmm. um, got two more questions. Uh, if you'd like to take them now, uh, Laura H says, "What would be your holy grail of the Nintendo Power art?" Uh, a piece that I know does not exist, unfortunately. Oh um, no! <laughs> it, yeah, it's the um, the cover for number one, the clay cover for number one. I know that it was destroyed. Uh, it was so Gail Tilden. If you, and if you've watched that, uh, the oh, what's the most recent documentary? The like, the, like Power Up or something like that level. Oh point yeah. Or whatever. Yeah, yeah I know what you're talking about. I can't think of the yeah, name. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, so uh, Gail um, Gail Tilden is is featured there heavily, but she was the essentially the founding editor in chief of Nintendo Power Magazine, and that piece, the clay cover, uh, that was actually it was sculpted by a Will Vinton artist who did like the that studio did like um, uh, California Raisins and like all the like the the Michael Jackson video uh, mm -hmm. uh, claymation and all that, the Moonwalker claymation. Um, that studio did that piece and um and it was sitting in an aquarium in her office for years and at one point while she was out of town or over a weekend they moved her office like a like a a, a, t a company came in and like moved people's offices around and they just they dropped it <laughs> um and uh that is the most heartbreaking story i have ever heard in my life um that's sad but of stuff that i know does exist um any of the the comic art um that was done by exclusively japanese artists which makes it difficult and very celebrated japanese artists too like the the same artist that did the legend of zelda manga in nintendo power also created power rangers like hmm. <laughs> that 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 level of uh of of fame so like that's that's the other side of 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 the difficulty of contacting Japanese artists is either they're so obscure no one knows who they are, or they're so mm. unbelievably famous that I mm. can't possibly. Now in that case, that 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 artist is deceased, but like, but there, there a lot of these Japanese manga artists are just like so incredibly famous they're completely unapproachable. Yeah. Um. So, so yeah, that you know, I I I have some things in the works for some things that I'm really excited about, but it's not quite far enough along that I can talk about it in a form like this. But um but yeah, uh it the any of the like this the Super Mario, Legend of Zelda, Star Fox, uh Super Metroid, uh those those four comics, any any pages from that would be awesome. I'm trying hmm. what um what I would what I ultimately would like to do is to be able to say that within the collection I have an example of everything. So I don't need I don't need all the art, right? That's that's an impossible goal, right? Especially since I would never know when I was done because I don't know what's been thrown away and I don't know what Nintendo has and they're not going to be very forthcoming. So, um so I would ne there's no way I can ever know when I'm done even if I had all of the art, 
But what I would like to be able to say is I have an example of everything so that I can tell that story. So like even like the digital stuff, despite the fact that it, that's not really my focus here, like I still have, I have reached out to a lot of those artists. I have digital files. I've recreated, you know, the, even, even a lot of the digital things, I can at least say that I have examples of here's the digital cover. Here's, here's what digital interior looks like, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so that I can eventually tell that story. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. So we got, uh, we got one more. Okay. question here in the Q&A and this is a this is a real Pandora's box here so brace brace yourself here because I, I reserve I, the right to not answer anything <laughs> <laughs> all right so this is from Richard Rose it says are there any other gaming magazines that deserve preservation of their art or would even have the quality of art that Nintendo Power had all of them every single one um I my undying hope is that there is a Stefan Reese of GamePro and a Stefan Reese of EGM and a Stefan Reese of all these. Someone needs to be out there doing what I'm doing for all the other publications. Absolutely, they're all valid. They're all, and, and they all had artists that worked just as hard, right? Um, mm -hmm. And even, and some of that stuff is as difficult as it is to source some of this for me. Like the more obscure magazines, that's going to be like way harder. Like, you know, where they had like some of these illustrations were drawn on a napkins you know it's just like that that stuff is is mm -hmm. going to be incredibly difficult to source and so like i want there to be someone like me for all those different publications it's just that this takes so much focus and so much time and so much money and so much energy that i can't be that guy for anything else like it's mm -hmm. just i can't I, I, I can't like occasionally if like i find an artist that didn't Nintendo Power, but then we're like working a deal. I will like buy everything they have, but generally that's so that I can trade mm -hmm. the other stuff for Nintendo Power art, right? Um, yeah. So, uh, so yeah, I just I can't. At, there, I want there to be a person for all those publications. It just can't be me. Are you saying you can't do everything yeah. at once? That you're uh, I cannot. It's capable that you could be spread thin. <laughs> it's true. All right, that's so a great answer, though. Thank you. Let's drive into some interior art, shall we? So um, interior art came from a lot of different sources. Uh, sometimes, um, as is in this case with Turok, um, the battle for the Bionosaurs. Um, this this one is uh, my favorite example because it was used in so many things. So the, the actual finished piece, obviously, is on far left here. Uh, it started as the cover for a comic, Turok the Empty Souls number one. Uh, then became the cover for the Game Boy game, and then was used as the splash piece in the interior for the coverage in Nintendo Power. Um, so while some things were made for Nintendo Power by Nintendo Power people, uh, oftentimes you would get just art imported from other places, other sources. Um, this is uh, kind of, I wanted to show how intricate and beautiful uh, some of the art was created for these, basically like these throwaway insert pieces, right? The, um, this is this is a piece for a magician. It's uh, by a um, an artist named Lee McLeod, who is you'll see some of his work later. He's just an incredible uh, traditional artist, and this is all hand painted. Um, some of the there might be some airbrush in the background, but he wasn't primarily an airbrush artist. So this is this is all painted by hand in acrylic. Um, I think I've got a, a couple examples of his work here. Yeah, again, here is, this is for uh, the, the Immortal, right? Again, a, a beautiful uh, fantasy piece for just this little, you know, three three by four inch piece on a page. Um, this is also Lee McLeod. Uh, it's a splash piece for flashback. So again, um, I, as I mentioned, there's uh, there was a team at, at, that, that did a lot of the interior work, but they still did, there was so much work to be done that they would still have to outsource more art. <laughs> so that's why you got like in the, especially in the early issues, even like page for page or even sometimes on the same page, um, the art styles would, would differ drastically because there wasn't, there was too much art required to, uh, to, to be done by the normal staff. So, so sometimes you would have 
a staff artist splitting a page with either another staff artist or a contract artist um, just to get the work done. So, which, which made it, I love that aesthetic because it made it a magazine that it, like as a kid, I felt like it was a magazine that me and my friends could have made, right? Like, because the, the, the art direction was just so all over the place. Like it was, just, it just seemed like something that like me and my friends could do. And I just, I just love that aesthetic. Um, so here's an example. This is an internal piece. Um, this actually, I just wanted to show if you do, like I, I, as you can see, I frame almost everything, which uh, is probably one of the most expensive aspects of, of this project. In 2020, I spent $30,000 on framing. Um, yeah. Oh dear. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, which is why, you know, if you see me like selling pieces of my retail collection, which I care less about, but that market is on fire right now. Yeah. So like just this, this last week I sold, like I had a, I, I mentioned I started doing sets, right? And so I sold a couple sets to essentially finance the next year of this project. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so this is uh, Super Nintendo Tournament Fighters, obviously. And I just kind of wanted to show clearly how all of this is framed. Um, so that uh, I frame everything, or I try to frame everything with uh, with the pa the corresponding pages, so you can see directly, like, okay, well, here's here's Michelangelo, and, or the, the original piece for Michelangelo, and then right above him is um, uh, the printed page, um, which is why it's, it's so funny that I I laugh about people grading Nintendo Powers because first of all, the the print runs on the where the, the print run for Nintendo Power number one was 3.2 million. There are a lot of that issue. Um, and, uh, but like here, you know, people are like grading these books and here I am pulling pages out. Cause you know, and people think it's like, I understand people who like clutch their pearls and get sacrilegious about, uh, about me pulling pages out of, out of magazines. But like the fidelity, like I can't get the same print quality out of a color copy. Like there's just no way that I'm going to get the same quality of print out of a color copy as I am just tearing a page out of a magazine. So um, again, like I, I understand that, that, you know, from the preservationist angle, there's this like, oh my God, he's tearing pages out of magazines. But I feel like sacrificing one of each magazine for this project is probably okay. Um, I had a question for you, Stefan. Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, you mentioned, you know, you'd have on the same page, you know, maybe you'd have multiple staff artists or a staff artist and a contract artist, et cetera, et cetera. How common was it for the, um, you know, the, the developer or the, the publisher of the game that was being featured to provide Nintendo Power with art assets? Or was that totally uncommon and, and unheard of at the time? Incredibly uncommon, save for a lot of times they would use the cover art for the game um, for, in fact, actually Tournament, fight, Tournament Fighters for the Super Nintendo is, a, is an example where they used the cover. Steve Levine, one of the Mirage artists, painted the covers for all the, the Tournament Fighters games. And so they actually use that cover as, as like the header image. But mm -hmm. for just like little spot illustrations, virtually never. There's actually, I can think of one example that I have they're not within reach, otherwise I'd show you. Um, but uh, I have the spot illustrations from the manual of Clay Fighters for the Super Nintendo. And I, I own those because they were also used in as spot as illustrations for the coverage in Nintendo Power Magazine. So virtually never would they, would like the developer set, like paint something for the magazine and send it over, but they might send them something that they used for something else. Right? Yeah, because you, you think that they'd have their own promotions and advertising and stuff. You know, maybe they were purchasing a, a page ad, ad in the magazine or something like that, which would have art assets, you would think. But it, it seems yeah. like they had just something they didn't provide. Yeah, and in fact, like, and uh, it worked the other way, too. Like, I talked to, um, oh, God, help me out. It's these, the, the creator of um, Maniac Mansion. What's his name? Oh, geez. I've heard the name a thousand times, but I, I know. Anyway, that guy, someone in the chat hit me up. Um, but uh, so I was talking to him about that Maniac Mansion piece, the, the, the clay piece, just kind of like maybe he might actually have it somewhere. Right. Because, again, memories are funny. Like, even though they said that the, the artist said that he destroyed the mansion, maybe he didn't. Uh, yes. Thank you. Ron Gilbert. Ron Gilbert. <laughs> no, 
So I was, so I have some principal photography of that mansion. It's not so, so like actual, like they took it out in the sun and they like photographed it. And I shared those and those are all available on Twitter as well. Um, but I shared those with Ron Gilbert and I said, like, did you have any input? Like what kind of input did you have? Did the magazine give you? And he said, the first time that I ever saw it was when they handed me the magazine. So, so it worked both ways. Like there was just didn't seem to be much communication either way um, between publisher and, and Nintendo Power most of the time. Hmm. Uh, so this is I, this is an example of a painted cell being used as an interior uh, art piece. This is for Plock for the Super Nintendo. Um, so the way in which the artists um, provided art seems to be more or less to their discretion. So um, this is an artist named Kevin Brockschmidt. He's awesome. And he's done a lot of work. He did a lot of Mega Man work. And, and for basically a long time, if you saw a painted cell in the magazine, it was his. Um, but that was just his style. He just did painted cells. And so anytime that he drew for Nintendo Power, they were painted cells. There was another artist that, I, I'm not kidding you, works in Cran. And uh, and so that I have I have a um, uh, spy versus spy piece drawn in crayon, um, and that and and you know uh, other artists that work exclusively in colored pencils or or Copic markers or like each each of these artists really had their own style and it seemed to be free reign for them. This wasn't a direction that Nintendo Power gave them. They just said, hey, draw this thing. And actually, in this case, this is a a, a redraw of a, um, and going back to our conversation about the publisher, which makes it funny, uh, Tony, is that this is a redraw of art from the publisher, but it's not the art from the publisher because I, I talked to them, mm -hmm. the creators of Plock uh, have this, the, his version of this piece, he owns it. So that's like why, like when I posted this originally, I got some feedback from, from Twitter saying like, hey, this, this might be a fake you know, like the Twitter community, they're like, this might be a fake. I'm pretty sure they have this piece. And so, uh, but it just ended up being a repaint. So even though the publisher had this piece of art, rather than acquiring it from them, Nintendo just had someone redraw it, which is crazy. That is kind of crazy. So like, I mean, is that something that Nintendo would have had to have licensed to use and it was just cheaper to use a contract artist? Or what do you think the scenario I, was, if you were honestly, to guess? Honestly, I don't know, because 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 I've found instances of Nintendo... Got it. Do I have it? I might have... Hold on. I might have it. I have it right here. I'll show you. I do have it. You're in luck. Oh. So this. This is a redraw. And I'll hold on. Let me unshare screen for a second. Bloop. OK. This is of Mario from uh, Super Mario Land, the cover. Right. This is <laughs> um, but this is first party Nintendo art. Like drawn by it's 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 a redraw by Nintendo of a piece of Nintendo art. Like so, it might just be it could very very well just be like a communication thing where like like I remember like when I was working for Disney, I was working on a Hannah Montana game, and we had to I ended up having to use MIDI art or, or MIDI music in a Hannah Montana game about Hannah Montana, about Hannah Montana music, I had to use MIDI music because we couldn't afford to license the music from ourselves. Nice. Which is <laughs> bananas. But like, so, so yeah. there could be, there could be a business case. And again, you know, it's been 30 years. So like people remembering business cases for something this obscure is hit or miss. Um, yeah. But, but it could be something like that, where it's just like technically having, you know, them having to license work from themselves might have been too yeah. expensive. I, I, I don't, um, I don't know. So uh, related, um, I have a Nintendo source book from 1998. 
So basically, if for anyone that's not familiar, it's like a, a marketing guide. It's like a, kind of like your business Bible. And it's full of art and covers and, and things that you could utilize as a as a retailer, basically. But even though some of the games were already released, the logos for many of the games are placeholder or older versions. And it, it just to Stefan's point, um, it seems like communication within Nintendo was probably very shaky because even their marketing department, you know, later on in the 90s anyways, in the, the N64 era, they were just pulling whatever assets they happened to have on their PC and just throwing it in, into like a binder and giving it to their retailers. Even if it was like a logo for F-Zero X that was like, three years old like very very bizarre sort of business practices yeah here's another example i don't even know what these were used for i know a hundred percent that this was here let me turn this off uh, i know that this piece a hundred percent is from a nintendo artist a first party nintendo artist who also drew a lot of other things that i've shown but this is these are tracings from yoshi's island the source book and the the yoshi's island strategy guide I don't know what these were used for or if they were used at all, but they were literally just traceovers of like, this is, this is on tissue paper. Um, hmm. They were just traceovers of the strategy guide. Somebody at Nintendo for some, for some usage had to trace over a published piece of Nintendo work. It's, it's bananas. Like, I don't, I don't know. Strange. Yeah. Very, very <laughs> strange world that they lived in. I feel. Yeah. All right. Oh, so this is um, another, obviously another clock piece, but like, again, this is a couple of these slides I just put in to really show like how much work was put into the most minimal piece of art. So the only place in this magazine that this clock piece shows up is this background silhouette that's half covered by screenshots. And like somebody spent a significant amount of time <laughs> painting this piece. And, uh, and it was used as a, as, a, as a silhouette for the background of this page. Um, this I put in again. It's it's a it's a, a beautiful painting made for a two inch thumbnail or less. Um, this is Gradius, but I also wanted to uh, Gradius two or three for the Game Boy. I wanted to throw it in here because this is actually uh, this was the first piece of art that I that I paint that I bought. So this 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 piece. Remember I was telling you about the the um I was telling you about the gameplay counselor who uh who left gameplay counseling to go paint for nintendo power um this was when he said oh i have a couple pieces this was the first thing that i bought from him so this 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 piece started all of uh, us us talking today this piece started us talking today <laughs> down the rabbit hole um, again another beautiful piece from blackthorn um and sometimes like so here's an instance like this is uh this piece was uh provided from blizzard right so like there's no way blizzard has actually <laughs> The couple pieces of Blizzard art that I do have, they're not crazy about me having them. They really are a company that is really into keeping their art. Um, you know, art is Blizzard's you know, bread and butter. And so, um, but this is a case where, um, you know, the only the only piece for Blackthorn is this little tiny uh, thumbnail of a flag. And it's this gigantic painting <laughs> that was made for this tiny, tiny thumbnail. Um, and you'll also see that a lot of times in like um, things like Star Wars, Indiana Jones, the big movie games. They'll just use movie stills, so there's really nothing except for like maybe some background painting. So like I have a bunch of from the Indiana Jones Super Nintendo game. I have a bunch of like it's the like the the staff, the head of the the staff, and uh, the cross of Coronado, and I have there are these beautiful pencil drawings that were just used similar to that plot car was just used as this like half faded out background and they just used movie imagery instead so a lot of times for stuff like that um you'll see cases like this where it's just if, if you want a piece of blackthorn um nintendo power art this is you got this flag and that's it <laughs> um this i wanted to just kind of point out it does one of the wonderful things about nintendo power is that it allows us, same thing with like Mario First Party, but it allows us access or 
as, as difficult it is as, as finding the stuff is at all, um, it still allows us some manner of access to first party art. Because like all of the actual like Kirby, like you're never gonna find a cover for Kirby, like or a cover painting. Like Nintendo has all of that stuff. Like, um, and so uh, so it's just kind of fun. Nintendo Power kind of provided us a uh, a way in which to enjoy original art from first parties um, without actually having to like find covers for games. Um, similarly, and I. Did I not put the uh, really? Is that on the next one? Yes. Okay. Good. Uh, um, fade in. Yes. <laughs> fade in. The one fade in. I don't know why I faded that in. I think it was probably beautiful. Though. Um, time driver. Uh, time diver. Aeon Man. Uh, for people not familiar, this game doesn't exist, or what well, it does. They. 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 I mean, Tony's probably familiar with it. It's a. It's a prototype game that never made it to market, but the finished game exists as a now as a bootleg. Like everybody makes carts of this game. But um, there was no, it, it, it didn't get to the marketing phase aside from Nintendo Power Magazine. So Time Diver Aeon Man, the, the only place that art exists for this game is within the, pa the pages of Nintendo Power Magazine. So this is an opportunity where, like, this is the only art. I have a few other pieces from, from this game, too. But this is the only source of art for this game. Like, when, even when you see, like, the bootleg labels that they make of this game, they're using this image. <laughs> Um, so, uh, so yeah, it, it was just the only opportunity. Sometimes Nintendo provides us opportunities for art that just we wouldn't ne necessarily otherwise get. Um, kind of rounding out, I talked a little bit about how difficult it is to find Japanese art, um, and I did uh, m uh, mention Orange Nakamura. Um, I was lucky enough to, to source uh, some of his uh, pieces, and he it was the artist that did all the signature like big bulgy. I mean, you can see the 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 artwork here, like the the big bulgy eyed kids um, that they used for like little kind of splash images or spot images all around the magazine, and a lot of the title headers. So he did a lot of like um, players pulse um, and and power players. This is all Orange Nakamura, um, and as far as I know, this is the only um, the only existing. Uh, copies of his work. I just kind of wanted to flip through some of that. Japanese art, man, it's so so hard. Good. Cool. More. All right, we're uh, going to wrap up the interior, but I couldn't go away without talking about maps because um, this is a piece of this is kind of a segment of. Uh, Nintendo Power production that people don't even think about. Um, there weren't ways to take screenshots when the when when they were making maps for Nintendo Power, and so essentially what they were doing they were photographing the television and compositing um, compositing maps together. So that's why if you look at even on like all the, like the the level layouts. For individual issues for individual games, when they're, you'll notice like you know with Ducktales, you'll see like every couple screens or every screen, you'll see Scrooge stand in there somewhere, and it's just like Scrooge, 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 or Mega Man, Mega Man, Mega Man, all and you know on on this level layout because they were just photographing the television, um, and unfortunately, there's very few or maybe just this one example of uh of the the art remaining because it was really just considered like a production asset it wasn't even even considered art the only reason why this artist kept this particular map is because it was the first thing that she did for nintendo power magazine so what you're looking at here this is the dragon warrior this also appeared in in the guide and there's like this map is very this is this is the dragon warrior overworld map um, what you're looking at is about 250 Polaroid pictures that have been chopped up and pasted together. And if you look here, I get real close. Um, you can see, like, so on the left here, you can see like all this like weird variance in the water because again, these were just these were just photocopy or these are just Polaroids. So you can actually match them up. On the right, that's the like. That's the production image, right? So this is the production image, and you can see on the map where these Polaroids were. You wouldn't necessarily like look for them. Uh, I never noticed these this kinds of things, but um, 
but you can absolutely see where, I mean, this line here is right here. Um, and you can, you can absolutely match them up. So she just, she took her and her husband made a device that would freeze the game without crashing it. And it was just this thing that like sat in line. And I, I, I asked her if she still had it. Unfortunately, they didn't. So I don't exactly know what it was. But um, but they they uh, they had this device that they could essentially freeze the game, take a photo, and then move to the next screen and take a photo and move to the next screen and take a photo. And I don't know if you can see it here, but you can see that one. There's like a bunch of places where you can see the hero on this map. Um, just standing around like there's one there on the yellow. Um, he's just standing around places on this map because they were just taking they were just taking photos of of the screen, and that's how that's how maps were made for Nintendo Power. Can you imagine the number? I don't know if if you've ever played the original Dragon Warrior, uh, but can you imagine the number of random battles she had to go through? To get these photos, yeah. <laughs> like, like yeah, yeah, yeah. it's was, wild. Like that is yeah, this was, this wild. Was, this was hundreds of hours. Yeah, hundreds of hours. Yeah, absolutely. Incredible. Yeah, and again, this is one of the stories where um, I talked to the primary layout artist who did most of the maps for Nintendo Power for a, a good chunk of years, and uh, and she said, you know what? I had all of them about ten years ago. I had all of them sitting in the attic. I showed my kids, and they and they were like, "Well, that's great, mom," and they just didn't care, and so she threw it all away. Oh no! <laughs> so no. this might be the only remaining actual production map from Nintendo Power. Wow. There's a comment here from Chris Small that says, "I always wondered about the miss, the weird mismatched water when I was a kid." And... <laughs> yep. There you go. Come to think of it, like I remember seeing it as a kid, uh, not specifically with this map, but with others, and not like it just, I remember, like it, it, it was cognizant of it, but never really thought too deep into it. But this is weird to learn now. Yeah, hundreds, hundreds of Polaroids. Can you imagine, even just the expense of that Polaroid film? Can you imagine how much this map cost? <laughs> Polaroid yeah. film is expensive, man. I hope that uh, Nintendo Power allowed her to expense costs. <laughs> oh, I would hope so. Yeah. Uh, all right, so we're getting into comics. Unfortunately, like I said, I don't currently have any of the uh, those sort of the big four uh, manga comics, but I wanted to talk a little bit about Howard and Nestor. So this is actually the um, uh, original art. I don't own it, but it's the original art for Howard and Nestor number one, the very first appearance of Howard and Nestor. So like this this header art here is the same header art that they would use throughout the throughout the initial run. Um, it's uh, painted by a gentleman named Shuji Amai, um, and he was there were there were either four or, or five um, Howard and Nestor artists as time went on. Um, there is allegedly there might have been an American artist. That took over for Shuji Amai that was specifically hired because he drew like him. So it's very difficult to know whether or not that story is true because it's like, yeah, it, the, the story I was told to me was, I think I remember there being someone that might be true, um, but I'm not sure. So, like, some of the work here that I'll be crediting to Shuji Amai may not actually be Shuji Amai. Um, but this is absolutely the. Um, the uh, art for the very first issue. One thing that I think is interesting about all the Howard and Nestor stuff is that they lettered it directly onto the page. Um, there wasn't like in most comics where they would like leave open word bubbles and then and then letter it and post. Um, this was the artist lettering directly onto the page. Uh, here is a this is the uh, Mega Man Two uh, Howard and Nestor. Again, this is an example where I think it's Shuji Amai. Might not be, um, but uh, but here I just kind of wanted to show, like I was talking about like loss of fidelity, right? So here on the far left is the original is the original art. In the center is also the original art, but I'm really focusing on this on this Nestor uh, image. And then you can see that in the printed page is the the 
huge difference in color tone in line weight just the even though that you know this was a very expensive way to to print a magazine you know it was a high quality magazine you still lose so much between the original art and the published page so this is howard nestor is actually all right, the, t the, the top of the hour, I was talking about the guy that gave me those shoes, and he approached me with a bunch of Howard Nestor stuff first. And so he didn't just have art, but he had um, production materials. So I'm actually able to show you, this is going to be um, the entire process from start to finish for the Dragon Strike, uh, the Dragon Strike strip. So th it starts out with, so because these were contract artists and the turnaround time was very quick for the Howard Nestor stuff. It was a lot of faxing back and forth for approvals. So this would have been the initial fax from Nintendo Power Magazine, the editor uh, from Nintendo Power uh, with the script to the artist. And then here you can see the first uh, on the left here is the, these are all, these are all the first two are faxes and the last one is a color copy. Um, but, uh, but the first two are, well, the first, the first, panel is uh, an approval for actual like composition of frames. And then the second one is an approval of dialogue. So you can see now that they had approved the, the art, then the art is more final on the second panel, but then that they were asking for approval on the dialogue. And then the third piece being the, it's again, it's a color copy, uh, but of the original art, um, and uh, so you can see here from basically the artistic process from start to finish on this on this uh, on this piece, starting from a script uh, all the way to finished product. So this is like one of those examples where even though like there is no original quote unquote original art involved, um, it's still like I'm able to show process, and it, that even that is like super important to me. Uh, moving on to posters. Posters was kind of an interesting thing because uh, they were more than any part of the magazine uh, a marketing tool. So this is the uh, uh, this is the part uh, Tony you were asking about getting assets from publishers. This is the part where you would most commonly see that, where you would see assets from um, either the publisher or a marketing department. In this case, the image on the left here is actually it's a style guide piece from you know, you can see that it's actually got DC um, branding on the page. Um, this is a style guide piece for the Superman cartoon show. So they just literally lifted this out of the style guide for the show, provided it to Nintendo Power, and they made a poster. Um, here again, this was drawn for the magazine, but this is by Bill Morrison, who, if anyone is a Simpsons fan in the room, Bill did the vast majority of the licensed work for The Simpsons for a good many years. Um, so even though it says, you can see it here, sorry, I lost my mouse. You can see here on the finished piece, it actually says Matt Groening. Matt did not paint this piece, obviously. Then that's the, that's the case with a lot of Simpsons work that is branded Matt Groening or signed Matt Groening. Um, it's not at all him. Uh, but this is, so this was drawn by Bill Morrison, the Simpsons kind of go-to guy for uh, published art and then uh, turned to the uh, a poster. Unfortunately, this is, this is kind of the blue line rough for him. I don't own the original art. He doesn't know where it is. Um, but, uh, but this kind of just kind of shows you his process. Um, hi, baby. Oh no, I can, I can fix that in a minute. Okay. Told you this was going to happen. Okay, leave them right there, and I'll fix them, okay? All right, thank you. Awesome. Daddy's going to finish his phone call, okay? Thank you, baby. All right. Um, so here you see, this is, uh, this is a more, um, yeah, I told you it was going to happen. Um, so this is also Lee McLeod. We've, we've looked at Lee McLeod's work all night, um, and again, phenomenal, 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 phenomenal artist. Um, and if you look at the Demon's Crest box. Uh, it, one of the things that Lee McLeod is just amazing at is replicating work. Um, so if you look at the box art, I don't have it pictured here, but just Google it. Um, I mean, line for line, this thing looks like a replica of uh, of the, uh, the piece on the cover. Um, so Lee McLeod is just a master at replicating work. 
and uh sorry for my kids toys over here <laughs> um but uh but uh yeah so this is not provided by um not provided by a a, a production company but lee is just an, a masterful artist and i wanted to show it he also did this, this piece which is incredible because this is a paint over so underneath this painting is a photograph and so what he did was he photographed and actually this this gentleman on the left he uh i ended up finding him and reaching out i'm like is this you and uh sure enough it was but uh but but so lee in this case he painted over a photograph so um the the gentleman that he painted over and then he kind of filled in in the rest in the background I think assume that this was just a photograph um, when they look at the actual poster, and it's not; it's a painting, um, which is crazy. He's just Lee is amazing. Uh, the last section here I wanted to go over was reader art, which is by by and large like again, all of this is nightmare difficult to find. It's not easy to find any of this, but reader submitted art is by far the most difficult because. Nintendo never returned it. There were children. Like, and there was like privacy concerns, right? Like, and and so the only way that a lot of this exists is either it was someone took a photograph of something they made, like a physical object, and and sent it into the magazine, or the envelope art left the building somehow, uh, and then and and wound up in my hands many years later. And that's that's the case here. So this is actually what you're looking at is the entirety. Every every issue of Nintendo Power, uh, almost every issue, had a section in which they would post um, reader-submitted envelopes. And so this is every single reader-submitted envelope for this issue. Um, and, uh, like, I can't... When th this, this was one of those things where it, the, I was approached by this. I was not... I had already given up on finding envelopes because it was just like, why would they exist? Um, and I had already known at one point in the original call center at Nintendo, they had like a wall where they'd put up uh, envelope art. Um, but when they tore that building down in 2012, the early teens, um, they tore that building down and presumably that wall just went with it. Right. And so, Finding someone who spirited away uh, any of these envelopes is ridiculous, um, let alone a full set of, uh, of the reader art. So here's some close-ups on stuff. I didn't take close-ups on some of this because it actually has kids' addresses, and even though they're obviously adults now, it still feels weird. Um, so, uh, but, but here's some close-ups. Uh, and then here's another one. This is actually, so this was done by a different source than the previous ones. This was done by a reader in on a military base in South Korea. And um, what she had done, and she had been, she was young at the time, but she, she did, for the, this was for the, the 100th issue of Nintendo Power. She drew this image of Marilyn Monroe. And over it, this is the name of every Super Nintendo and N64 game to date, like to the time of that Nintendo Power uh, of that Nintendo Power issue. So if you go and and get you have to get real real close because the writing's real real small, but all of this text around Marilyn Monroe is the name of every Super Nintendo and N64 game, all of them. It's crazy the amount of work that went into this envelope. And it was just, it was meant, you know, like she didn't think she'd ever see it again. No one ever thought that, that anyone would ever see it again. It was just a throwaway piece of work. But the amount of work that went into this, just writing these names, like I can't, it's, it's, it's a lot of work for a little kid. Um, so last, this is probably, this might actually, I wanted to end with probably my favorite pieces in this collection. Um, so again, I, I, I told you I had, uh, Kind of given up on envelope art and i was like okay well like what other stuff like i, I want something like user submitted right like i want a reader submitted i want something and so i started going through issues and looking at objects that kids made but then photographed 
and then sent photographs into Nintendo Power. So uh, Clea Forkert, at the time she was, she was, I think, 12 or 14 years old, and she made these plush Mario uh, figures and, um, and, and took a picture and sent them in. And so, you know, at the time, I don't think anyone ever realized that, you know, 30 years later, a name and a location would be enough to find someone sometimes. And so I ended up finding her on LinkedIn. And, uh, and I reached out and I kind of, you know, explained my story. And I was like, do these still exist? And she's like, well, some of them do. These were just like little felt dolls that she made. Um, and, uh, and so some of them just like completely disintegrated, but, but, uh, but these three survived and she was so enamored that anyone cared about her work that she like essentially wouldn't let me not take them. So she ended up, she ended up uh, sending me these three. So this is a, this is a, an example of, you know, a, a, a kid making a doll and photographing it, sending it to Nintendo and 30 years later, here they are. Like I like it free this kind of stuff is what like freaks me out that like they still exist. Like I, I can't even imagine like all of the just the the normal wear and tear that these things went through for thirty years and then have them still be still be here. Um so this is like when people ask about like my favorite favorite like item, this is this is these are one of them because it's it's just like the, the odds of them still being here today are, are just astronomical. I think that That's is really wild. My last slide. All right. Uh, and again, like I said, everybody, this is not uh, it by any means the the totality of the collection. Um, but uh, but it would we'd be here all night. This was already sixty something slides. So um, so I I was I you know I was happy to put this together for you guys. But you know I, I definitely encourage anyone to follow me on Twitter. Uh, at Art of NP, or if you just search for uh, Nintendo Power is excellent SEO for me. So if you just search for Art of Nintendo Power <laughs> on anything, you will find me. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, so yeah, definitely if you want like the day to day of my collection, definitely check me out there. And again, when we get fished out of this pandemic, um, I'm gonna go back to you know hitting the pavement real hard and getting out there and and exhibiting at shows. Um, it, you know, I, I had a, I had actually started that that Portland show 2019 was my first, I did, did a, that exhibit on Nintendo gameplay counselors. The plan was then to to kind of add uh, the art of Nintendo power stuff into my rotation. At that time, it was only a couple dozen pieces. So now that since then, you know, I've had the pandemic to really concentrate on this thing. And um, and I've done very well in that retrospect or in, in that aspect. So now. Um, you know, the art of Nintendo power is absolutely front and center uh, as what I'm doing. So I'm I'm so looking forward to getting back out there when we can safely and show all of this to you in person. So, yeah. Definitely a quick question. Can, uh, from... There's questions. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I just wanted to bring this up here from uh, Chris Small. Um, he says, uh, did you know that there was such a community interested in these things regarding the dolls? Oh, like uh, the, no. the plushes. And, and, and I, I don't, I don't know that there, that there still is like, there's no, I'm the only one I, like, at least until today when I'm going to make all of you interested. Um, I'm the only one, I was only the only one out there <laughs> looking for the stuff. You know, I, 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 I half jokingly say that I collect garbage, not that those dolls are garbage, but like, but some of the like the weird production stuff and that kind of thing, like half the time when I buy something from someone, you know, as they're handing it over to me, they're like, I don't understand why you want this, but I'm happy to take your money. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, that's um, that's uh, that was that. So as far as like, like I'm, I'm super happy, like and I didn't even like when I started the Twitter account uh, a little over a year ago. I didn't even know that there would be this much interest. Like it was like um, I had like my general like collecting Instagram thing that I was doing, but then like I was getting so much art that I wanted to do something specifically for it. And, um, and, you know, it's, it's done incredibly well. And, uh, and is, there's, so I'm, I'm super grateful that there's this kind of response, but even I didn't know that 
how interested people would be in this work. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, let us know here if we have any additional questions in the chat, if anyone has any additional okay. comments. I am quickly losing my voice. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually getting over a cold myself, so occasionally I apologize. I've had to <coughs> clear my throat in the background. Hopefully it didn't mess up the uh, the audio too much. It did not. Uh, Christopher says, uh, I have a great friend who collects VHS, and that is word for word what people say regarding sort of like, I don't know why you want this, oh, yeah. but <laughs> here it is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, and there's also the challenge of like um, sometimes, you know, because I'm reaching out to people who haven't even like thought about some of this work in 30 years and being like, hey, let me buy this from you. So like there's some doing less so now because I have so much. But in the beginning, there was a lot of uh, just kind of convincing people that I was safe. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, like, hey, do you still have this thing that you drew when you were 12? Like that's like that's it's uh, yeah. in the beginning, those kinds of conversations were difficult. Yeah. Well, I think as you, you know, like you mentioned, like you've curated a lot of content and people are starting to know a lot more about what you do. And as a result, people trust you and you've become the name in this type of collecting, which hopefully will propagate and snowball even more. Yeah, it's always been walking a fine line between wanting to share things and then not creating my own competition as much as as best that I can, um, which there's mm -hmm. going to be some of that. But um, the really the only reason like and people are like oh that's selfish whatever because i am so protective of it because i know my drive and i know my intentions and i know that this collection mm -hmm. will go in mass to a museum or to mm -hmm. you know another permanent solution right it's not going to get pieced apart and sold to the highest bidder um yep. none of this is you know um, in fact, some of the stuff that I I buy, I like, I essentially I tell I tell these artists like whatever you want me to sign, fine, like whatever, whatever deal you want, like we'll do that as long as like it comes home with me, right? Um, and so like I have deals set up with some of these artists where it's like I am contractually obligated not to sell their work, like it has to go to a museum, right? And that, but I'm still paying for it. So like, it's literally me mm -hmm. like hem hemorrhaging money that I absolutely <laughs> cannot get back. So like, I, you know, as as selfish as it might um, be uh, to the other, you know, some other collectors in the community that feel that way, um, because I know that I'm keeping this stuff safe and that it's going to be continued to be shared, not locked away in a basement, mm -hmm. not sold to the highest bidder, not whatever, right? Um, that this is something that like, at the end of the day, I'm going to have this gigantic collection to share in mass, right? Um, and keep it all together um, is really important to me. So if that means that I am a little bit guarded as far as like processes or, you know, or anything like that, or like my network can, you know, there's no one, no one's going to roll up to me and like ask me for someone's an artist's phone number, you know, like that kind of thing. That's just not something that I do. Um, but mm -hmm. it's just because I'm so incredibly um, protective of the legacy of this collection. Yeah. Well, you're, you're, you're very passionate. And like you said, that, you know, that it's going to, um, it, it's going to be going to a good place and it's all, you're doing it for all the right reasons. Right. And and by the way, I would recommend um, taking a look at some of these comments here. The, some very high praise <laughs> regarding uh, you. what you're doing here. Uh, I had no idea how really this panel was going to turn out because it's like so it's such a different experience when I'm like, you know, when I have this stuff on like on a on a display around me and like talking to people directly to it. I had no idea how this was going to pan out when I'm just like essentially showing people pictures um mm -hmm. so but i'm i'm really really glad that everyone was so receptive of of the the panel and and i'm definitely going to continue to do stuff like this so absolutely yeah thank you everybody who joined us today really appreciate all of your comments and all of your questions as well okay. right. <laughs> thank you again everybody right. thank you everyone really appreciate it